diplomacy with North Korea laser focused on making sure that it never again has to reopen the North Korea nuclear file. Those remarks from Washington's top diplomat Mike Pompeo, while a former U.S. defense chief believes North Korea will never completely denuclearize. Plus, the big two one-on-one -on, -one on trade as their trade tussle threatens to reignite into a full-blown trade war again. The White House says President Trump and President Xi Jinping will very likely meet on the sidelines of the G20 summit in June in Japan. Our top story this morning, though, it's been about three weeks since the South Korean government submitted its extra budget proposal to the National Assembly. The government wants it passed this month so it can have maximum effect. So the clock really is ticking now. The government and the ruling party are calling for lawmakers to put aside their differences and get back to work so the bill can press ahead. Our Kim Min-ji starts us off. South Korea's ruling Democratic Party, the government and the presidential office have pledged to put all their efforts toward getting the 5.6 billion U.S. dollar extra budget bill passed before the end of May. They say downside risks to the economy, plus fine dust pollution and recent natural disasters make the extra budget all the more urgent. In a high-level meeting on Sunday, the three sides agreed on the need to get legislative activities moving again so lawmakers can start deliberating the bill. The three sides were on the same page in regards to swiftly passing the extra budget proposal to deal with fine dust pollution, the aftermath of natural disasters, and to revitalize the economy. We will do all we can so that rival parties can agree to pass the proposal this month. We will also work to pass other urgent pending bills. The government submitted its supplementary budget proposal to the National Assembly in late April. However, deliberations have been put on hold amid a prolonged parliamentary standstill. The main opposition Liberty Korea Party has been protesting after the ruling party and minor opposition bloc fast-tracked key reform bills despite their resistance. The ruling party called on the main opposition to return to the negotiating table, saying that if they really care about the people's livelihoods, then they need to get work done on relevant bills. The National Assembly needs to get working again as soon as possible in order to deal with the extra budget proposal as well as other important bills. We call on the Liberty Korea Party to return to talks as soon as possible. We will also actively push for talks between the president and the leaders of the rival parties. The three sides noted that if the extra budget proposal is to be passed by this month, then the policy speech on the bill must be held no later than this week during a plenary session. They also vowed to step up preparations so that the extra budget can be implemented as soon as it's approved. Kim Min-ji, Arirang News. Now, we could get a hint today on how President Moon Jae-in plans to approach his third year in office when he holds a weekly meeting with his top aides. Attention is on whether President Moon will describe how he plans to surmount the current stalemate in the peace and denuclearization process on the Korean Peninsula, given the latest developments, especially North Korea's recent firing of projectiles and missiles. According to the presidential office, this afternoon's meeting will be broadcast live through an internal system for all employees at the top office to watch. It will be just the third time such an in-house screening has been shown. Now, Washington's top diplomat has reiterated that one of the Trump administration's top foreign policy goals is to achieve the complete denuclearization of North Korea. Saying he and his team are laser focused on the issue, Mike Pompeo also hit out at previous U.S. administrations, accusing them of making no progress or even making the situation worse. Kim Hyo-sun reports. U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo has once again pledged not to follow the path of previous administrations when it comes to negotiations on North Korea's denuclearization. He explained that efforts by previous administrations failed and even led to the additional development of the regime's nuclear program. According to the State Department, Pompeo made the remarks during an address to the Claremont Institute on Sunday, celebrating the think tank's 40th anniversary. The top U.S. diplomat stressed that Washington's aim is to make sure the North Korean nuclear file does not have to be opened. He explained that this is in line with the Trump administration's goal of achieving the regime's complete denuclearization so the nuclear issue would not be brought up again. 
Pompeo also made it clear that Washington is determined to cooperate fully with South Korea and Japan while convincing Russia and China that the move is in the best interest of the international community. Such remarks are seen as an effort to differentiate the Trump administration from previous governments by opening the window for dialogue despite the regime's latest short-range missile launches, as well as stalled talks between Pyongyang and Washington. Meanwhile, former U.S. Defense Secretary Robert Gates told CBS Face the Nation that he believes the North will never completely denuclearize. During the interview, which aired on Sunday, Gates said it would be difficult to make progress in denuclearization negotiations with Pyongyang, but stressed President Trump took a, quote, bold stroke to engage in dialogue with the regime. Kim Hyun-san, Arirang News. The South Korean government is pushing ahead with plans to send humanitarian food aid to North Korea. However, instead of expressing perhaps a bit of gratitude, North Korea has labelled Seoul's efforts to help as uh, quite condescending. Cha sang reports. Despite the regime's recent firings of short-range missiles, the South Korean government is still pushing forth ways to provide humanitarian food aid to the North. And to this, one of North Korea's propaganda websites, Beari, on Sunday condemned the idea, blasting South Korea's attempt as rather condescending. It said it was deriding for the people of North Korea as South Korea is pushing aside the basic problems of the inter-Korean joint declaration to instead talk about a few cases of insubstantial humanitarian aid, all while making it sound like the move will lead to huge progress in inter-Korean ties. It further criticized Seoul for being ill-mannered and deceitful to people who share their roots, citing South Korea's attempt to facilitate, quote, joke-like bartering or personal exchanges. The news outlet said that if South Korea was genuinely interested in developing inter-Korean relations, it should stick to the implementation of the agreed joint declaration on inter-Korean cooperation without being self-conscious of the United States. Although Mehdi did not directly mention the food aid that's being reviewed by Seoul, analysts say the word humanitarian hints at the project. North Korea expert Dr. Shin Bum Cho says the North is putting out two different messages, expressing disgruntlement about Seoul's approach to influence denuclearization talks with humanitarian aid, and second, a message to refrain from discussion of North Korea's food shortages. It's an expression of dissatisfaction with the South Korean government that blocked public attempts to change the method of inter-Korean dialogue or denuclearization talks and publicizing the issue through humanitarian aid. Responding to the criticism, South Korea's presidential office said it will remain cool-headed and carry on with its plan to send food aid as Meari is not an outlet with public confidence adding that the website did not directly target the food assistance for criticism. Cha sang Arirang News. Now, North Korea may be poorer and even more volatile uh, than formerly thought. A British daily made such an analysis based on nighttime satellite images which revealed that the North's annual GDP per person actually hovers around 1,400 US dollars, and that is well below South Korea's estimate of over 2,000. Citing the new study in World Data Lab, a private company based in Vienna, the Times reported Sunday that no nocturnal luminosity for the regime reduced by 40% from 2013 to 2015. The report pointed to heat waves and drought as the main reasons behind such a drop. With the high-stakes trade talks between the U.S. and China hanging in limbo, President Trump's economic adviser says the two leaders will likely meet next month to further discuss the issue one-on-one. -on -one. However, in an interview on an American TV network on Sunday, Larry Kudlow also contradicted his boss's claim that China will pay for the tariffs, instead saying U.S. consumers will end up footing at least part of the bill. Lee Sung Jae reports. In an interview with Fox News Sunday, two days after U.S.-China trade talks ended in Washington with no breakthrough, U.S. National Economic Council Director Larry Kudlow said President Trump and Chinese President Xi Jinping are likely to meet during a G20 summit in Japan at the end of June to further discuss trade. 
We want to be as sure as we can be. We don't think the Chinese have come far enough. We'll wait and see. The talks will continue. And I will say this is a G20 meeting in Japan uh, toward the end of June next month. Um, the chances that President uh, Trump and uh, President Xi will get together at that meeting are probably pretty good. When asked whether he believes China will retaliate, Kudlow says it's likely Beijing's counteractions will become clear soon. I think I do, but it's interesting. The expected countermeasures have not yet materialized. Uh, we may know more today or even this evening or tomorrow. Um, yeah, I reckon they will. We'll see what they come up with. So far, we haven't heard on that uh, basis. However, during the interview, Kudlow also acknowledged that American consumers will end up paying for the administration's tariffs on Chinese imports, contradicting Trump's claim that the Chinese will foot the bill. Instead, Kudlow said China will suffer GDP losses with respect to a diminishing export market, adding that both sides will suffer. Over the weekend, President Trump accused China of playing for time in trade talks and warned he will offer a far worse deal if he wins the next presidential election in 2020. He added it will be wise for China to act now, emphasizing at the same time that he loves collecting big tariffs. Lee Seung-jae, Arirang News. Now, let's have some uh, sports news because there's quite a lot going on at the moment. And we're going to start in golf. South Korean golfer Kang Sung-hoon has won his first ever tournament on the PGA Tour. Kang closed with a 4-under 67 to finish at 23-under at the 2019 AT&T Byron Nelson in Texas on Sunday. He won by two strokes over Matt Avery and Scott Piercy. Kang was tied with Avery up until the 15th hole, where Kang rolled in a 23-foot birdie putt to take the lead, and he held onto it. Kang's win comes in the 159th PGA Tour start of his career, eight years after he made his professional debut on the tour. He is the sixth Korean to win a PGA Tour event. Now, the Korean monster, Ryu Hyun Jin, has picked up his fifth win of the season for the LA Dodgers, allowing no runs over eight innings against the Washington Nationals at Dodger Stadium. The pitcher only allowed one hit all game and none in his first seven innings as his team won 6-0. to zero. Striking out nine while throwing a career-high 116 pitches, Ryu has now pitched 24 scoreless innings in a row. Manchester City claimed its second straight English Premier League title on Sunday after beating Brighton 4-1 in the season's final match. The back-to-back -back title win is the first in the EPL since Sir Alex Ferguson's. Manchester United pulled off the feet in 2009. Liverpool finished second with 97 points, giving them the highest points tally of any team to finish second. In the English top flight, Chelsea finished third, a whopping 25 points behind Liverpool. Tottenham Hotspur and their star striker Son Heung-min finished fourth with 71 points, meaning they've qualified for next season's Champions League. In fact, I'm sure you'll remember the London side will face off against Liverpool in the Champions League final on June 1st in Madrid. Iranian President Hassan Rouhani has admitted his country is under unprecedented pressure, swamped by the weight of global sanctions. For more on this and other news from around the world, let's turn to our Hong Yu. So, just how bad is Iran's economy right now? Well, Mark, according to President Rouhani, Iran could face harsher economic conditions than during the country's war with Iraq in the 1980s. As Iran faces tightening U.S. sanctions, Rouhani said on Saturday that his country was under pressure comparable to when Saddam Hussein's army invaded Iran in 1980. U.S. sanctions on Iran's energy, shipping and financial sectors have hit oil experts and caused foreign investment to dry up. 
But with President Trump's new sanctions on Iran's industrial metals, such as iron, steel, aluminum and copper, the Iranian economy is expected to shrink even more, according to experts. The Trump administration also deployed an aircraft carrier and bomber task force to the Middle East last week, claiming that it was a response to a possible threat to U.S. forces in the region by Iran. The pressure is expected to continue and could go further until they negotiate a new deal. Rouhani, who is under heavy domestic political pressure, called for unity among Iran's political factions to overcome the conditions. He said he has great hopes for the future and he believes Iran can move past these difficult conditions if they stay united. The French hostages who were kidnapped while on safari north of Benin and freed in a high-risk mission have thanked the fallen soldiers and the French government for rescuing them. They also told reporters after returning home on Saturday that the travel guidelines issued by the French government should be fully respected. We thank France, its army and intelligence services for its professionalism and its humanity. We hope that all this violence will stop to give way to a more brotherly world that will finally try to understand each other. The southern Korean woman who was also held with, with them arrived in France and is reportedly undergoing health inspections under the protection of the French military. A Myanmar pilot has safely landed a jet without a front wheel after the landing gear failed to deploy. The Myanmar National Airlines flight touched down at Mandalay International Airport on Sunday morning. All 82 passengers and seven crew members able to safely evacuate the plane after it skidded down the runway. The jet was approaching the airport when the pilot found out that the front landing gear was malfunctioning and could not be activated. After following emergency procedures and burning off fuel, the captain came in for a landing with no front wheel. Time now for our Life and Info segment where we focus on information that we hope is useful for your everyday life. Now, an African swine fever case was confirmed at a slaughterhouse recently in Hong Kong as this contagious virus has been spreading in China and it is ultimately resulting in soaring pork prices. Against this backdrop, South Korea's agricultural ministry will restrict the use of leftover food at pig farms in an effort to prevent the disease taking hold here. The Environment Ministry says it will make the pre-announcement of the amendment to the enforcement rule on the Wastes Control Act to include such a measure. Now, prices of pork belly, which is very popular here in South Korea, jumped nearly 5% in the country this week compared to the previous week, with the average price standing at $2.30 per 100 grams. This is also a whopping 16.5% increase from April. Now, with summer fast approaching, health officials here in South Korea are warning the public to keep an eye out for ticks in order to avoid tick-borne illnesses. The Korea Centers for Disease Control and Prevention reported the country's first case of severe fever with thrombocytopenia syndrome, or SFTS, in Chungcheong Namdo province early this month, followed by another case in Kangwondo province. The case has come about a month earlier compared to last year, and advisories have been issued in the Gyeonggi-do, Gyeongsang, and Jolla provinces. Seoul City said it will notify the public of the distribution of ticks along the Han River parks and trails. Visitors are advised to wear long sleeve shirts and pants and avoid lying down on grassy areas. Symptoms associated with SFTS include fever, nausea, vomiting and diarrhea. Now, regular exercise has long been known to have a positive effect on your general well-being. However, a new study here in South Korea has found that daily exercise where you break a serious sweat can actually be worse for you than exercising more lightly a few times a week. Park Se-young with more. 
Sweating is often seen as a sign of a good workout, and when it comes to exercise, many people think that more is better. However, a 13-year study on nearly 260,000 people by Yonsei University Graduate School of Public Health has found otherwise. The researchers found that people who exercise until sweaty three or four times a week were 14% less likely to have high blood pressure, 13% less likely to get diabetes, 21% less likely to have a heart attack, and 20% less likely to have a stroke than those who did not exercise at all. But exercising every single day actually reduced these preventive effects or got rid of them entirely. That's because exercising without taking a day off to rest does not give the body enough time to recover and puts a burden on the heart and blood vessels. The researchers say there is such a thing as too much exercise and that regular vigorous activity three to four times a week is enough to keep one healthy. In fact, the U.S. National Institute on Aging has found that weekend workouts alone can be enough to prolong life. In a six-year study of 3,400 men and women over age 40, researchers found that those who exercise one or two days a week had the same low death rates as those who exercise multiple days a week. These so-called weekend warriors also had health benefits similar to those who met the goals of 150 to 300 minutes of moderate to vigorous activity a week set by the Physical Activity Guideline for Americans. Experts have pointed out that this study can't prove whether it was exercise that reduced death rates, but added that all physical activity is good, whether done throughout the week or crammed into the weekend. Park Se-young, Arirang News. Now, the Hangang Project Headquarters of the Seoul Metropolitan Government has been organizing some seasonal events as part of its summer festival. Now, one of them is the Hangang Night Walk 42K a long overnight walking program to enjoy Seoul's night views and sunrise at the Han River. The event is going to kick off at Yoido Hangang Park on July 27th. Now, the start time varies according to what course you choose. The 42-kilometer course will depart at 8 p.m., 25 kilometers at 11 p.m., and 15 kilometers at either 7 p.m or midnight. Now, the longest course, scheduled for 11 hours of walking, consists of four checkpoints, Jamwon, Gwangnaru, Duksom, and Ichon. Uh, spaces for 10,000 walkers will be available on a first-come, first-served basis until July 7th, and uh, entrance fees depending on the distance you want to go. Good morning. Temperatures on Monday will etch down a couple of notches, but will remain on the warm side, except for eastern parts of the country due to the easterly winds. While the air is still quite dry, with dry weather alerts remaining in place, well, we have rain in the forecast for northern parts of the country, but it's not going to be enough to ease the dryness in the air. And it's forecast to be partly cloudy to mostly cloudy all day, but UV rays will still be high in most parts with high levels of dust at times. And daily highs will be ranging between 22 and 28 degrees Celsius, so we're getting up to 25 degrees this afternoon. As we can all feel, summer is right around the corner and temperatures will soar to near 30 degrees Celsius by the end of the week here in the capital. But Seoul will remain dry this week, while southern coastal regions in Jeju Island will see frequent showers. That's Korea for you and here's the international weather for viewers around the world.
Well, that's all we have for now on this Monday morning here in Seoul. Do stay tuned to us here on Harirang TV. And the daily reminder that our next newscast is coming up at noon Korea time with our very own Lee ji -yoon. So until then, goodbye. Planning a